on the Twitter at Shannon Moore at Chris in the Box. You know the drill. So I have been cramming to try to finish this book. I have an advanced copy from Peter McGuire. He's so kind to be on with us tonight. Um, Ty Stick. And of course, he's written other books as well. Um, uh, Law and War and Facing Death in Cambodia, which my daughter read this weekend and was just completely traumatized and now is writing a whole thing on genocide. So he's a historian and former war crimes investigator. And of course, uh, he's joining us. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. The surfer. The surfer and professor and I was reading about you earlier today that you te- that you've taught law and war theory at Columbia and at Bard College and what what is war theory? Uh you begin with Sun Tzu and move on to Karl von Clausewitz and um you know it's actually the philosophy of war. I really want to take that class. Can I audit? Absolutely. I'll be offering it at University of North Carolina, Wilmington in January. And, you know, there's a spot for you, Shannon, as long as you carry my book. <laughs> of course I would. I would. I, I've been reading this because I hate to interview anyone without, you know, reading their book first. It seems like sort of a no brainer. But I I don't know if I need to, like, actually smoke a tie stick or what to, like, uh, under this this doesn't see your book does not seem as though it's possible i mean it's these the surfers the scammers the untold story of the marijuana trade this is is this true it is true what you think the introduction shannon <sighs> i try i i'm really trying very hard to keep track of all of these characters and Mr. Ritter, who you co-wrote this book with, um, I, I just felt like I was in this like incredible movie. I could almost see it. I mean, the whole, um, just, this is so complicated. Yeah, these were modern-day pirates who basically uh, needed to find a way to finance their endless summers. And um, growing up in Southern California... They were sort of our heroes, and I was a young lifeguard in Malibu and knew many people in this world. And for many years, I kind of tried to, to pretend I was a you know, straight history professor uh, that didn't have this other life that I had led before I moved on to academia, but I figured it was time for me to come out of the cannabis closet. Well, just just the fact that that these surfers who were part of this giant drug trade, just, they didn't really think it was immoral. Like, it, no, that it was just like, not. like it was it was sort of a pesky fact that it was illegal and there were really high prices to be paid. And, and certainly there were people executed um, who, who were caught. But that this, I, I don't understand why this story hasn't, hasn't been, well, part of the vernacular of the, the war on drugs. Well, you, you know, you figure that, um, you know, you had a generation of, of many of these guys were draft dodgers and had basically been turned criminal as a result of, of dodging the draft and evading service in the Vietnam War or, you know, minor criminal convictions for marijuana use. And uh, they um, just left the system. And in, in the case of my co-author, Mike Ritter, he dra- was a draft dodger, went to Afghanistan, began, very, they all begin very small, and the thing just escalates. And so by 1974, uh, the tie stick, the finest marijuana really of the 1970s, grown by the hill tribes in, in northeast Thailand, um, one pound of tie sticks in the United States was two thousand dollars in 1974 so basically you know if you could fill a boat with tie sticks and get it back to the united states you could set yourself up for life one of our favorite narrators uh uh, mike charlie tuna carter one of the great captains of the thai marijuana fleet he brought back six tons in i think 1975 and netted something like 20 million dollars that he seal a meal put in igloo coolers in his yard and called it the bank of the igloo underground um but that's that's half the story the other half of the story is the south southeast asia 1975 to 19 
1979 was probably one of the most dangerous stretches of water in the world, given not only the pirates, the boat people, the Khmer Rouge, the Vietnamese Navy. So the DEA was the least of the worries that the Thai smugglers faced. Well, and in going in going through this whole like the 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 pirates and perils chapter, it, it was just. I can't believe that any that they were taking that kind of risk. But like you say, I mean, for two thousand dollars, it's like you could buy a house in nineteen seventy four for that. Oh, absolutely. And um, you know, my co author Mike Ritter, he would uh, contract basically, you know, Thai fishermen, and Thai fishermen will traffic in anything. Smuggling is not really frowned upon in Thailand as long as you make money. Um, and marijuana to the ties is is grown in every garden in the Northeast. It's a it's a, a therapeutic plant. Really, not many people even smoke it. It's used in chicken soup. It's used to soothe um, menstrual cramps and help pregnant women and this and that. But the idea that that the U.S. government was coming down on this, the ties had a hard time uh, taking it even seriously. So. So when, so when they decided, when the when the DEA decided that they were going to go after this the way that they did, what was I mean? Why do you think it was specific to that? To money, that? it was all about money. And uh, there was one DEA agent in particular who um, we interviewed extensively, named James Conklin, and he was a Vietnam veteran who understood Southeast Asia. And he very candidly told us that in his early years in the DEA, he started in the uh, BNDD, the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. Uh, he said that marijuana was called kitty dope, and they weren't allowed to touch it, and they had to focus on heroin. And he said the thing that turned the tables was the money, and that he got a tip from an informant about a Thai marijuana smuggler's house in Santa Barbara, and then he began to see the assets that these guys had, and it absolutely blew his mind. And he was the first one to really begin to get his head around it. And he single-handedly pretty much took down the Thai industry. So by 1988, they, um, they arrest uh, Brian Daniels, who had uh, two gigantic loads come across the Pacific. Um, and one was in a boat captained by two former Green Berets, and it had been loaded by the Vietnamese military. And so, you know, money transcends all things. And the actual smugglers, they I, I really would compare them to, you know, the rum runners or the moonshiners or the North Georgia Mountains, where there was an arbitrary law against this, but they didn't see it as immoral or, or anything else. Well, it was uh, Dave Kattenberg, I think it was one of the people who you had cited in here. And mm-hmm. and he had said, you know, he was a f- former Vietnam veteran who said that basically, like in the 70s, it was like a Robin Hood sort of thing. I just oh, found absolutely. that. And, and yeah. the the links that you make between these people who are, who are draft dodgers, who are Vietnam vets, who, who are the Vietnamese military, and, all, and, and they're all... It was like there were no obstacles for them anymore. It was just it was like they had just had one currency. Absolutely, and you know, for many, um, and it was interesting because for many who served in Vietnam, and for many um, uh, who were draft dodgers, the defining event of their lives was the Vietnam War, and so you had these very disparate groups come together in the post-75 period, because you had Vietnam vets who had the trade craft, language skills, knew the country, they could procure loads, and then you had the surfers who could sail boats, offload boats, and all that, and they formed um, an uneasy alliance, which breaks down uh, over time, and many of the former military guys uh, become confidential informants um, and are much more comfortable uh, dealing with the government and turning on their form, former co-conspirators where, um, I mean, you know, the, it's, it's 
difficult to generalize about who turns and why, and pretty much everyone gets busted. Hey, everyone. hey, Peter, we got to grab this break really quick. We'll be sure. back on the other side of this break with Peter McGuire, Tie Sticks. We have lots of questions coming in from our listeners for you, Peter. Oh, fun. Now, and, and, and okay, what is a tie stick? I always thought it was marijuana wrapped around a stick and enhanced with other drugs. Curious, this is from Curious in Tennessee. Curious, excellent question. Um, that is an urban myth. Uh, basically, at the time and growing up, I thought the same. And they would say, oh, it's opiated tie sticks. They're dipped in opium. But in fact, it was incredibly strong cannabis sativa that was masterfully tied to a piece of a small piece of bamboo, often with a thread of hemp fiber. Um, and it was just uh, like so many things in Thailand, they tie them to a stick. And in the Northeast, they would take the marijuana, tie it to a stick, and then keep it in the kitchen. And then when they wanted to smoke it, they would wrap it with uh, often just newspaper and pull the stick out and smoke it. Um, so that's the genesis of the tie stick. And it's a very small window. It's like 74 to 76, 77. And then the ties get greedy and uh, they overproduce it, and this little boutique industry um, uh, disappears. Um, an interesting side note, the first marijuana I ever smoked um, at 10 years old, um, my neighbor stole a tie stick from his neighbor, and we wrapped it in a piece of notebook paper, and the ensuing intoxication was so strong, I didn't smoke marijuana again for about three years. Until you were 13. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. You know, smoking pot lowers your sperm count, right? I have two healthy sons, and <laughs> maybe I should, you know. I think it wears off happens. after a while. My God, 10 <laughs> yeah. years old. Um, this is interesting. Lydia writes in, and she said, co authors in crime. This is this is an interesting question she has, and she says, "Wow, Shannon, white surfer boys doing dope and trafficking, turning it into a big criminal multi-million dollar enterprise, getting away with it for a long time. Yet a black kid walking down the street in the, in the United States with marijuana residue in his empty pockets goes to jail and then prison for huge stretches. Yeah, that sounds fair. Amazing how some things get glamorized and others aren't. Have you had this? Uh, she, I, I would completely agree with her that we have a two-tiered criminal justice system. Um, I grew up with uh, many members of the Crips who spent great deals of time in prison. Um, one of my best friends who's in the book, uh, he wound up doing nine years. And so she's absolutely correct. However, um, glamorizing it and this and that, I, I wouldn't, I think she's wide of the mark there, given that my co-author went to prison. Most of the Thai scammers went to prison. They lost everything. Whatever riches they earned were all taken. So um, I would, I would say she's, she's about half right. But I totally agree with her on the criminal justice system. And in the sentencing in the Thai cases, it was really twisted in that the masterminds would often uh, turn informant well, where the guys who touched one bail would wind up doing serious prison time. So that I'm writing a second book right now that will deal largely with the, um, the legal fallout of all of this. Well, and, and it, it should be said that y you... You do go into it in the book that the two scammers who were captured were executed. Yeah, uh, four Americans were. That's how the book started. Was I was a war crimes investigator in Cambodia. I found the confessions of four Americans in a prison. Twenty went, twenty thousand went into, and about twenty survived. And people suspected they were CIA agents, and I knew that they were marijuana smugglers. Um, given my background growing up around surfing and in Southern California, um, all four, you know, had come from California. And, um, and you know, I, I then reached out to people I knew in the surfing community, and, and, and they said, oh, there's a guy named Mike Ritter you need to talk to. He was in Thailand at the time, and that's how I met my co-author. Well, you know, there, there are pictures, and it was curious to me how the surfer culture became so much a part of this trade. I mean, it was just sort of back and forth. And here's these, you know, bronze gods with like paddle boards with bags over their heads posing for pictures. 
Well, yeah, and, you know, many of the photographs and most of the photographs in the book were given to us uh, by smugglers from their personal archives. And uh, and the surfers possessed the, the trade craft to do it. I mean, they many were good sailors. They were very comfortable in the surf, in unloading boats and bringing it onto open beaches. And so it was it was a, like I said. It was just a, a small window of time, and and the real moral of the story is about Pyrrhic victories. And so, the DEA busts most of the surfers because they're not hard criminals. And who replaces them? True gangsters. And so, um, the true gangsters come in in the early '80s. They ramp the thing up to you know 40, 50 ton loads, and the, the DEA busts them completely destroys the Thai marijuana industry, one of the true successes in the war on drugs. And then what happens? In the places they're most successful in eradicating marijuana, Thailand and Hawaii, it's replaced with methamphetamine. So, uh, you know, and now, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And now we have this pharmaceutical drug industry where the baby boomers can now, you know, take a pill uh, America consumes something like 90% of the world's opiates, and, um, and you know, we're going to bust, you know, a young black guy for marijuana residue in his pocket. So uh, America has a very schizophrenic, schizophrenic relationship with drugs, um, and I think it's time we all grow up, and, and that's part of my reason for writing the book. And the, and the medical cannabis thing, I'm out in California, and it's basically legal here. But it's a joke. I mean, you pay a doctor to get a card, and um, even that is is kind of dishonest. I mean, I feel like, uh, you know, enough's enough already. Well, you know, uh, Gizmodo put out a a piece today that Sweden um, is closing their prisons, many of their prisons, because they don't, they lack people to put in them. Uh, which is a wonderful problem to have. And, and you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of, in fact, on the show, we've had uh, law enforcement people come on who are for the legalization of marijuana because it's just, just insane, insane what, what people are doing, uh, what they're asked to do as law well, enforcement it, with that. And, and it's, you know, you look at the, one of the biggest uh, lobbyists working against the legalization of marijuana is the private prison industry. I mean, that, sure, just the fact that we have private prisons makes me sick, that they're prisons yeah. for profit. Yeah, it's the prison industrial complex. And as you correctly pointed out, the people who really favor legalization are, you know, law enforcement. They don't want to bother with it. And ironically, the people who are pushing the hardest against legalization are the black market pot growers. And, you know, it's sad to me that they're going to get left behind. The price is plummeting. And, you know, these kind of Wall Street cretins and these Monsanto types are trying to elbow their way in. And, you know, they make this frankenweed now grown under lights and ridiculously strong. And now the anti-marijuana people point to that and say, oh, look at this. And, and my response to that is, look, there's you know, there's Everclear and Moonshine, and there's Coors Light. It's not all the same. And so I think the next critical step is um, a way to kind of categorize marijuana so that uh, people know what they're getting and they know how strong it is, and they can, they can make those choices in, in the same way that someone can walk into a liquor store and, and make a choice about what proof alcohol they want. Well, it looks like, yeah, we've got, the, the emails are pouring in, Peter. Can you stay on with us for a couple more oh, minutes? Yeah. I'm sure. so glad. Yeah. All right, so Neil writes in, uh, prison for dope. He says, um, he says, hello, Shannon. It's good to have this on your show. It surely sounds interesting. I'm pretty sure someone will make a movie out of it. I would hope so. I just tweeted it to my friend John Cusack, because this is up his alley. Um He says, on the other hand, it shows how things get on the radar. Once you start talking about large amounts of cash, the feds want it in. Shame that I have a cousin who got busted in grade school for smoking dope in the bathroom, pushed him down a road of being in and out of the system. So unfair. I just think what is a crime for one should be the same for all. I despise the unfair sentencing in our country. Um, I'm I'm right there with him. Uh, So do I. 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 
you know, I compare a lot of the sentences to, uh, you know, Albert Speer at Nuremberg, who appeared to be a well-spoken, upper-middle-class, white-collar criminal and lied through his teeth, was sentenced to a prison term where Julius Stryker, who was a borderline anti-Semitic pornographer who had nothing really to do with the genocide in a hands-on way the way Speer did, he received the death penalty. And so oftentimes um, somebody goes into court, lawyered up, looking a certain way, and they, they receive one sentence, uh, and someone who isn't as sophisticated and doesn't have those resources, um, you know, gets completely screwed. So I'm, I'm, I completely agree. Yeah, we've, we've had, um, you know, a lot of people on this program over the last, what, seven, eight years who are part of the Innocence Project. And, you know, people who have been on death row for 22 years because they were in the wrong place or the wrong, you know, or they're the wrong skin color, you know, and it's yeah. just like, and then they get exonerated. And and how they're not bitter is beyond me. I've, well, and then you have the thing like the distinction between, um, you know, powdered cocaine, which, you know, upper middle class white people use, and rock crack. And the fact that, you know, it's the same drug with a little bit of different processing and that you have different sentencing guidelines, that's probably the most racist thing um, I could point to in the war on drugs. And so many of the, uh, you know, black guys that I played sports with and grew up with in Los Angeles um, did serious prison time in state prison, not in club fed, for relatively minor offenses. And, you know, their lives were destroyed uh, by both... um, uh, you know, crack cocaine, and before that, Freebase. And I remember when Freebase came in, and I watched it turn a lot of my friends into zombies. Well, I know here in Alaska, there's a, a, a white upper class, middle upper class kid problem with heroin right now. And the reason is they've been able to get Oxycontin, maybe stealing from their parents. They get hooked on that. Oxycontin's expensive on the street, but heroin's cheaper. So now we've got like, you, yeah. you know, and and nobody is talking about it. It's well, the strangest it I mean, there, thing. Yeah, there it is. It's you know, people, you know, the drug, you know, drug addicts want legal pharmaceutical drugs. They don't even want illegal drugs anymore. So, game set match, war on drugs, defeat, loss. Let's move on. You know, let's begin to look at this rationally because. It's just a complete waste of time, energy, and resources. And, you know, and again, the idea that, um, you know, I was very heartened today to hear from one of my narrators that he had he had, had a bookstore send copies of Ty Stick to some of his former co-conspirators who were in prison in Terminal Island. And um, I just, yeah, I, I, again, it's time to grow up already. Well, it, it yeah, I think there are like nine countries right now that are looking at totally legalizing it. I think uh, Uruguay, last week we reported on this, or last month, I think maybe, um, that they had just said, look, we're going to grow it, we're going to sell it, and we're going to sell it cheap, and that way we're running people out of business. Uh, JB well, writes, he, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go, go. No, I want to hear what JB has to say. JB says, very true, he said, former law enforcement here, and I can verify some people automatically get far harsher sentences than others. It is race-related, also class. I'm not totally innocent either. Regret my part in continuing this. Then, then though, we have the biggest criminals of all, Wall Street, who will never do yep. any time for anything. Well, and that, I, I, you know, the, one of the things that's really struck me is, you know, like it or not, like them or not, the Thai smugglers were the true capitalists. These guys Adam Smith would have been proud of, where... You know, Wall Street, they're a bunch of pussies. They made a bad bet, and then they went crying to the government with their hands out. And they're, you know, Wall Street's Swedish socialism now. This is not capitalism. This is this is Adam Smith is turning in his grave. <laughs> it, it's so outrageous. I mean, talk about pirates. And, and, yeah. and, and, you know, I hear so much about entitlements. You know, right now we've got 170,000 veterans that are going to get kicked off of food stamps because, you know, you eat so well on food stamps, right? And yeah. and then you and yeah. then who do you who do you hear about? You know, has entitlement issues. Is that you know poor people have all these like like they won the lottery somehow in in being poor? 
Well, so- we have a kleptocracy, you know, and it's sort of like, you know, take away those Wall Street bankers' Summer Hampton shares for a week, and, you know, you'd be like they were in the Hanoi Hilton for five years. And, and I completely agree. The idea that these guys drove the U.S. economy into the ground, the neocons, broke the back of a generation of young Americans who had five, four, five combat tours, and now they can't even get health insurance. It, it's disgraceful. And the most disgraceful thing is the fact that the, the body politic of America isn't up in arms in it. And we have two parties. They're all kleptocrats, and, and people still take this charade seriously. Um, I, I've been heartened by some of the young people that I've met on the book tour, um, and, I, and I see an interesting convergence of, you know, the college-educated debt slaves and the veterans. And basically, both of them got screwed, and they're from the g- same generation. And the sooner those two groups uh, combine their re- resources, the better. Yeah, I too. I, the Occupy movement. There've been others. I, people are waking up, and Hello? I really, I really think that we are moving from this. Hopefully, we Uh-oh. are able to move from this place of greed to a place of grace for people. Phone just die on me? Nope, I can hear you just fine. Um, and JB did say, um, he said, please let your guests not misunderstand me. I'm not judging. I think he's right in what he's saying, and don't fault him for whatever he's done. He paid his sentence. It's done as far as I'm concerned. Did we lose Peter? I think so. Well, Dang it. Hmm. I don't know what that was about. The squirrel stopped running on the wheels of destiny. I, th- I think it might have been on his end, his phone. Well, um, I don't know. Do we have enough time to call him back? That's on, you know, they'll figure it out in there. Um, so, Tie Stick is the name of this book. You know, and it brings about a whole bunch of different questions for me. It really does. It just, I mean, just like exactly where you guys were going with this. Like, what is happening w- with who's getting away with it and who's not? And, uh, you know, this whole Laurel and Hardy on the high seas kind of thing, it's, it's really um, interesting to me. So the war in Vietnam opened up a whole lot of new sources, new markets, and levels of money. And uh, sorry, Peter, I thought you were raptured. Uh, no, I'm back. God sent you back. Thanks, did you God. Get, did you get me about the kleptocrat? I did. Okay. Good. I did. No, and, and you know, I, I keep. I'm not a member of a political party, and um, I really look at our country right now as though the corporations own the arena, and it's a global arena. It's not just this country, and so they own the arena, and they don't care. If you're going to yell for the blue team or the red team, they don't care who wins because they own the arena. They're going to be fine. Yeah, I completely agree. If you really want to read an amazing book about this very subject, um, Ed Villamy's uh, British war correspondent wrote a book called A Mexica about um, the cocaine cartels and how the big banks have laundered all their money with open eyes. And so as long as there's enough money to be made... Um, you know they truly don't care. So um, it's the new the new racism, I guess, it's just it's all about the green. Yeah, we, we yeah. thank you so much, Peter McGuire, for coming on with us and talking to us about tie stick. We're putting it out there as much as we can, and um, hope to talk to you again soon. Oh, anytime. Thanks again, Shannon. All right, take care. Okay. Bye-bye. This is Shannon Moore, the Shannon Moore Show here on KOAN. We'll be right back.